Oh my gosh. My name is, I'm going to give you my full um, name. No, I'm kidding. My name is Jose Ibarra and I am actually just recently turned 46. Awesome. Tell us about uh, your background. Where did you grow up? So I'm a native of Los Angeles. Uh, I grew up in, actually born and raised in Northeast LA. I think Cypress Park is where I was living at that time. Um, lived in Watts for my first few years of my life. Um, and then after that, moved to Northeast LA, Glasgow Park um, area, which is where I feel that I, I grew up, even though I lived in Highland Park, Glasgow Park and El Sereno, but Northeast LA is what really, um, where I call home. I come from a very blended family, um, blended as far as because both of my parents had a first marriage, but not blended because we never lived together. Um, my parents uh, were previously married. My mom had one daughter. My dad had seven kids. Um, they met. My parents are 19 years apart. Um, so growing up, it was more about just like my dad having two different households and just like um, seeing his side of the family on the weekends and then um, being with us during the week. Um, for the most part, you know, I, I, I do feel that I, I come from a very um, loving family. My parents gave me the best that they could. Um, um, given the circumstances of how we lived. You know, we lived in a one bedroom apartment, um, 11 people in that one bedroom apartment at one point. So when I look back and reflect, I look at it as like, oh wow, you know, I, I grew up poor. But I didn't think I grew up poor because it was just, we were full of love with um, the family being around um, and being that we were so close with our family, with our, our aunts and our cousins. Um, Growing up in a Mexican family, you don't not you don't have just your nuclear family. You have your extended family. So in, in the apartment building, actually, when I lived in Watts, I we lived in the back house of my aunt's house, um, and then when I lived in Glasso Park, um, we lived in an apartment building, and my aunt, other aunt, lived upstairs with my cousins, and then they moved down the street. So we were always around people, and then my grandma, for the most part, lived with us. So we were a very close knit family um, up until at least my grandma's death. Um, but for the most part, you know, I think that um, my parents did the best with, to what they can do to raise us, given the circumstances of gang violence and drugs and everything being in the, the neighborhood. So growing up in a neighborhood that had a lot of gang violence and drugs, I was kind of more of the type that was trying to stay away from it. Um, I associated drugs at that time growing up as something as a negative thing um especially with the the gangs around there so um i think in high school i might have drank a few times just you know at a party here and there but drugs didn't come into my life until i was away in college when i realized that it was a good way for me to escape from all of the trauma that um was finally peeling out off of myself um, so drugs were definitely introduced in college, um, but expedited, um, my drug use after college, after my grandma died. That's what kind of took the, the downward spiral. I mentioned earlier that, you know, we, I come from a very non-blended, blended family. Um, so my dad, I think, did his best to try to keep our families together, um, and as a kid, um, I think I was around six years old when I was um, molested by my brother. Um, and I say it all out right now because we've already confronted the issue um, and family knows. Um, and you know, for many years of my life, I blamed my dad for it um, because I felt that he knew what was going on, but in reality, he didn't. He was just trying to have our our families kind of together um, and that so it went from age six to the age 12 which I think is it stopped when um, I was going through puberty and he must have seen that that was you know okay let me stop now so at that point um, that's when I started realizing that s something was not right as far as my life but like I couldn't tell anyone because I just thought that He's my bigger brother that why would he do anything to hurt me? Um, and then blaming my dad for it of like, again, that I thought he knew what was going on. So I think that was the beginning also of my, 
the tension between my father and I, because um, also growing up, I always heard the thing of, you need to be more like your brothers, you need to be more like your brothers, because I was, I guess you could say effeminate, um, not knowing what that meant, um, but you know, I was not the sports guy, um, I was more the academics guy, um, but there was always that comparison, but why can't you be like your brothers? So the trauma consists of um, the molestation, um, the being put down for not being uh, a boy, per se, um, and just like having, I hate saying the word hate towards my dad, but there was definitely something um, there where, you know, he didn't want to show up to my music performances, my graduations. Um, but, I, you know, I, I could look back at it and I feel that he gave love the way he was taught love. And I had to accept that that's just the way he gave. I think at the end of the day, he gave us, you know, the, the house, the um, food and every shelter. Um, but, and then, um, you know, just growing up in an area that's with, full of gangs and seeing my sister going into the gang and then my cousins, um, the way I kind of felt it was going, it's kind of like a hierarchy where it's like, next person in line, next person in line, next person in line. So technically I was the next person in line to work, to go to um, a gang. Um, but at that time, two of my cousins had just came out of prison um, and then picked up one of my other cousins from our apartment. And they went to a party and at the party, um, one of them got killed and then the other one became paralyzed. And I think that was junior high school when I realized that like, maybe this is not the path that I should take even though that was the trajectory of people in my neighborhood. Um, so instead I chose to disassociate myself from, I lived in an apartment building from even like the kids there. And I picked up instruments just to use that as an excuse to say um, after school later and not be around um, the neighborhood. Cause back in the eighties, you know, um, kids used to stay out in the streets until it got um, dark. So I figured like, oh, I'm studying, I'm doing music. Um, I was playing the clarinet um, and in high school, I also kind of used the marching band as my way of just staying at practice of six o'clock, even though I didn't have practice, but I just didn't want to be home. I didn't want to be around um, the negativity um, of that. And then I, the other thing is just knowing that there was something different going on with me in my life that I didn't know what it meant. Um, I didn't realize until high school of my sexuality. Whereas in elementary, I got bullied a lot, um, being called a faggot and then being, you know, the only Filipino word that I know is bakla um, because we, li we lived in a Filipino area also. Um, but as a kid, you know, I, I could reflect back to it that like, you know, being called a faggot and, and a hoto and especially in the eighties when there was no representation on TV and just knowing that the only thing you hear about it is that it's something bad. So, um, as a kid, trauma is just like, I knew something was different with me, but the world was saying it was something bad. So I try to hide it and I feel that I use academics and music and everything just to kind of disassociate myself from that and figure out maybe this is just, um, a, a phase as people say, but in reality, it was just me trying to deal with my own sexuality, which in high school, um, you know, I, I, I dated girls back in high school. Um, I think I dated a girl for three years off and on. And every time we broke up, I was with another girl, but at the same time I had a boyfriend, um, that everyone just thought it was my best friend. And, um, and it wasn't that I was doing this to, um, be a fraud with the girls. Um, it was just, you know, back in this case, back in the nineties, just trying to figure out identity and like, just understanding who I was, which also meant high school was the first time I, um, attempted suicide. So my story also involves many, many suicide attempts because it was something that was not seen as a very light, very open or positive. So I instead decided that um, ending my life was gonna be the best choice. So 
you know, you look at this kid, high school that's active in student government, marching band, everyone thinks he's a, a great kid. Um, but in reality, I was dealing with all this, um, all these feelings and emotions of like wanting to end my life. So I think the first time I ended up in therapy, um, the counselor on campus was kind of shocked that I was in there because they saw me as someone that was, again, very active. They're like, wait, why is Jose here? And in reality, it's just like, I'm very good at hiding stuff. So I hid all of my feelings and emotions by being active in school. And that was the beginning of um, my many, many attempts of ending my life. So if I look at college, the, the using that I did, I, you know, I went to the UC Santa Cruz, a party school. I don't think I used more than my, my colleagues because I still managed to graduate. I still managed to kind of balance things out. But it all happened in 2001 when my grandma passed away. Um, I was away to call in college and um, so I wasn't here for her actual um, the day that she died. Um, My grandma's the one reason why I um, feel that I have success. She's the one that pushed me um, to succeed, even though she's had like a third grade um, um, education. But after she passed away, um, I went through a depression because she was my, my foundation. Um, so not having her around um, really affected me. And one day I was just on the internet and um, at that time, I was using a lot of pot and drinking a lot. Um, and I met someone from high school on the internet that um, invited me over and was like, let's come smoke. And I'm like, sure. Thinking weed. And I get to his place and he has crystal meth. Um, mind you, I've heard of crystal meth through other peers of like, don't use it. You know, you get addicted. And but because it was like this guy from high school that was a nerd. Meaning, like, he was art to see, like, you would have not think that he was someone that'd be doing meth um, nowadays, you know, you think about it, like, it, anyone could do it. Um, so he convinced me, because he's like, oh, you know, if I could do it, you know, you're cool with it. And one thing I've learned when I got sober is, like, you're always going to remember your first, your worst, and your last. Those three moments I remember very clearly. So the first time the drug went into my system, I realized like, oh wow, like all of this worrisome and um, depression is just out of my, like I became egoistic. I became um, like no one could fuck with me. I just became a whole different person um, that I didn't recognize um, that for someone that <clears throat> considers himself a family guy, um, I missed my sister's wedding because I was out getting high. I um, walked out of my younger sister's graduation a few times because I went to a graduation and the high wasn't working, so I had to go back to my house, get high, and then back and forth. So like, you know, for someone that um, considers himself a family guy, like I was sorry to do things that was worrying my family, but I think they never mentioned anything because they just probably felt like he's got it. Like he's the educated one, he has his life put together, but in reality I was just, um, calling for attention because I think that even growing up now that I think about like growing up like my parents gave me the the freedom to do anything because they were focusing on my sister that was in the gang and you know her running away and whatnot so I felt that it was my way of like I needed that attention too I needed that support that if I would have mentioned to them as a kid of my molestation and my sexuality that i could have fixed that as a kid but anyhow so fast forward to my drug use I just found meth as a way to really push all of those feelings aside um, I became an asshole I became I remember you know yelling at my mom something that I would have never done um, and I know you know she was hurting but I just think that they didn't know how to bring it up to me so again I just use meth as a way to escape 
And all of those friends that I had in my life up to that point, I cut off. I completely cut off anyone that was good in my life and just associated myself with anyone that was doing the drugs. And I was asked once, like, how do you maintain your addiction? Because meth could be expensive. But I ended up hanging out with one of the main drug dealers that I was the only one that in his little crew that had a clean record. So he needed someone to help deliver. I would drive and in return, he would give me good amount of drugs in return. So it was easy for me to keep my addiction when I didn't have to pay for it. And it was easy for me to keep doing it when I was feeling powerful, when I was feeling untouchable, when I was feeling, um, you know, F you um, and all of these emotions and depression were just kind of out of my life. But what was happening also is that anytime I would start coming down and that depression would hit is when I would keep using. So it, I was literally using every day, but it wasn't about using every day to get high. It was about every, using every day to just to maintain um, a sense of balance. Um, the weekends I would definitely get high, turn off my phone on a Friday night and then come home on a Sunday. And my mom would, I've had so many missed calls from my parents of like, where are you at? And I would just say I needed to get away. So high school was when the suicide ideation started. Um, I wasn't, I didn't have a lot of courage to do it, but what I would do is I would try to walk in front of cars to get, um, hoping that I would get hit and then just die. Um, that's also when I started doing a lot of poetry and just starting to write my feelings out. But it wasn't until college, my first year in college, um, that when I came to terms that I was molested um, because people were just talking about um, abuse and whatnot, that that's when I attempted the, my real first time I, I ended up in the hospital. Um, I tried to overdose with pills. Um, my resident advisor um, saw me in my apartment and my roommates at the time. Um, and that attempt was just more because I came to terms that something to me happened by someone who I loved and respected. Um, and at the same time, I was finally like now accepting of who I am, who I was as, back then uh, at 18, I was bisexual, but I'm gay now. Um, so I needed, I wanted to come out to my parents. So I kind of used my suicide attempt as a way to kind of come out because I figured if I come out right if they find out if I if I tell them that I committed suicide they're gonna feel bad for me then let me now mention that I'm bisexual because they cannot feel bad for me so I, I, I manipulated the whole situation um, like oh yeah you know I just came out of the hospital um, my parents were gonna go visit my mom was gonna go visit me um, and then I said by the way um, they're like why did you attempt suicide I'm like my brother molested me and that just started a whole new drama for the family because my side of, my dad's side of the family um, said that I was lying my stepsister called me the black sheep that she was just saying that I'm just doing this for attention um, so then they, it just caused more friction between both of my sides of my family where my mom's side of the family was you know, being supportive of it. And my dad's side of the family was just calling me a liar. Um, and my dad was in the middle, just not knowing what to do. Um, so that used that opportunity to say, hey, by the way, I'm bisexual because I feel I'm already at my downest point in my life that you have to support me. Um, but with the drugs, everything just got heightened even more. Um, the The one, I mean, I, I, I drove crazy hoping to, I would get hit. Um, I don't, um, the one I remember the, um, very clearly was writing my suicide note and taking all these pills and my mom realizing that I didn't go to work and my dog at that time kept barking and barking. And my mom went into my house and saw that I was on the bed um, with my suicide note. 
and I told her that she needed to take me to the hospital and because I was still alert, I figured let me manipulate this whole situation again because that's what drug users do. I told her you need to go to the bank, get money because you got to pay for the hospital. Um, I'll call the hospital and I'll let them know that I'm going to go in and as I'm, I'm on the phone with the hospital, I'm taking more pills um, because I figured if I didn't die this time around, I'm going to die for sure. Um, my goal was to die. Um, and as soon as I got into the hospital, I, um, they strapped me into my bed and cleaned out my stomach um, with charcoal. And I remember waking up, um, I think maybe a day or two days later, and the nurse, there was a nurse right by my, my side, and I was like, why are you here? And she's like, you're on suicide watch. And I'm like, you, you could go away. And she was, she was talking to me, and she's like, you know, mijo, like, you're educated. You got this, you got that. Like, what are you doing here? You seem like a good kid. Um, but in reality, like, that didn't really matter. Um, that was my first time attempting to get sober um, after that one attempt <clears throat> because I was told I needed to get sober. Um, and that sobriety lasted, I think, maybe two, three months. And I went to a birthday party and I literally had like this much alcohol. And um, by the end of the night, I was out looking for crystal meth again. Um, and that took me out for four and a half months. Um, my addiction got to the point where like using meth by um, smoking it or snorting it was no longer working that I wanted to shoot up. And I remember very clearly, um, rest, is, rest in peace, Kenny. Um, I'm glad he got sober afterwards, but I was hanging out with a friend that I would do drugs with a lot. And I was like, I need for you to shoot me. And I went like this, shoot me up. And he socked me on my face and said, I've already contributed to your addiction. Um, I'm not letting you go down that path. And I, when I got sober, he got sober a year later, and I would always talk about that specific moment. Um, and I would never say his name because in AA you're supposed to be anonymous um, about stuff. <clears throat> but he knew it was that moment that I feel that if he would have given me the drug through a needle, that my life would be completely, I probably would not be here right now. So I'm grateful for, for that because he respected me as a person. I think we were just both in heavily in our addiction, but he just did not want me to go that other route. Um, so anyway, so fast forward to <clears throat> April 18th. Seven, April 17th is the last day I used, um, 2005. I was out partying, weekend of binge drinking and drugging and I was hanging out with this group of guys and one guy specifically was not doing anything but he was taking care of his friend and we were talking because I talk a lot um, at times at times um, and he asked me like what are you doing here with us like with them he pointed as a group of the guys that I was with and I'm like I'm having fun and he's like you don't fit with them and I'm like what do you mean like you know you have your career you have your education you seem like you have a family your friends and like here we are like all of these guys are just like going from motel to motel like what are you doing with this group like you're wasting your life and it took this random person to tell me something that I've been hearing from people in AA from therapists that I needed I hope that you guys don't hear my stomach growling um, so it took this random person to tell me exactly the same thing that I've been hearing to kind of put it in my head like I need to change my life. So that night, I remember leaving the part, the the motel, and telling my drug dealer like I'm I'm done. And he's like, I'll see you tomorrow. I'm like, no, I'm like I'm done. And I think that was the first time I ever said like I'm done. Um, so clearly, like I had mentioned, like you remember, your worst was my when I ended up in the hospital um, for suicide attempt. And my last was hanging out with this group of guys that <clears throat> a random stranger that I sometimes wish I, could, I knew who he was because if, if it wasn't for that moment, I don't know when I would have gotten sober. Um, so I got sober April 18 of 2005. Um, the next day I woke up and I asked my sister to go with me to rehab. And she's like, I don't drive. And I'm like, 
I know you don't drive. I just need someone in the car with me because I don't trust myself that I'm going to go check into rehab. And um, she went with me and checked in. And they said, come back the next day. And that same night, I went to an AA meeting. Technically, I should have been home just letting the drug get out of my system. But I knew I needed change. And the first AA meeting that I went to was, um, for this, that specific sobriety, um, was a Spanish meeting. Um, I got sober in AA, um, Spanish AA. Um, I went to many meetings, but I feel that that's what got me my sobriety because I think for me it was very important to speak in Spanish among people that are dealing with addiction because I always felt that family was everything to me. And I only speak Spanish to my family, so I just needed that sense of um, normality. Of So, got sober, and um, I think that first year of my sobriety was hard because, you know, there's moments that you want to give up and give up as far as the sobriety because you're like, is this really what I want to do? Because in AA, <clears throat> you have to walk through the the trauma. I mean, I was doing AA, I was doing therapy, and finally dealing with everything that I kind of pushed in from my brother's um, molestation, from the tension that I had with my dad, my sexuality, um, the loss of my grandmother, like everything's finally like I'm dealing with. And, um, you know, it's taken time for me to get into a better place, but that road wasn't easy even in my sobriety and early addiction, I still had other suicide attempts. And it was just more of, I think that there was an imbalance with my um, mental health. But what I started doing is, I started checking myself into the hospital on my own. I would always call it a tune-up. Like you take a car for in for tune-up, I need a tune-up. So I think up until year nine, I took my last tune-up where I just checked into the mental hospital because I was afraid that, not that I was gonna commit suicide, I was afraid that I was gonna go back to the drug use because of the feelings that were coming up and that would have led me to suicide because I probably would have felt just very, like I fucked up now. So the only way out is to commit suicide. So I've been sober for, um, Sober from alcohol and heavy drug use for 18 years. And I'll explain what I mean with that shortly since this will be my first time really sharing this aspect of it. Um, you know, I think back at, to my sobriety and the things that I've accomplished um, and the things that I've experienced. Um, and in my sobriety, I gained the, the, the confidence to go back to school and I ended up getting my master's um, I've, I've seen my, the birth of my niece and my nephew. Um, I've traveled and explored, but I think most importantly, like I've worked on mending the relationships that I've I feel that I've gotten better with my relationships, but unfortunately in the last year, my dad and I just had a something that just kind of put us apart. But I think as I'm sober now, I know that what it is to have healthy relationships. And sometimes that means that you got to let go. And it's okay for me to let go. I've, I mean, it's a, in a place in my life where I don't talk to my sister. Um, the one that took me to rehab, even though we were close, but there was just differences that we saw um, that I just didn't want to do with. With her ignorance, um, I don't talk to my stepsisters because they've done a lot of stuff to make me feel that my dad and I shouldn't have a relationship. But anyway, so going back to my sobriety, um, back in 2020, I um, got sick with COVID. I was out sick for 10 weeks <clears throat> and I kept going to my doctor for like chronic pain, chronic pain. Um, and for six more months, it was just diagnosis and tests and everything. So I was diagnosed with fibromyalgia, which is chronic pain. And at that time, um, I did CBD and I saw that CBD helped out a little bit. 
And then a friend's like, why don't you try THC? I'm like, no, but I'm sober. <laughs> because in AA, they put it in your head, like anything that's um, mind altering. Um, but you know, I talked to my therapist, I talked to my family and just were like, I'm using it for the pain. So I, I say I'm 18 years sober uh, from alcohol and meth. Um, for the past three years, I've been using THC as a, uh, to deal with my chronic pain. Um, you know, coming back, I had moved away to Indiana, came back over here and just coming back to LA has been always, it's been a challenge because I've reached out to some friends that I had made in AA and they're like, well, you're not sober, so we can't, you know, be your friends. And I've reached out to other people and they're like, you know, at the end of the day, you're not using it to abuse it. You're using it to just kind of like live your life. Um, I will not use, I will not, will not drink because I know for me, even though it's been 18 years since I drank, um, I know that what that means. And that probably means that I will probably just as, end up finding meth just because it's still easily around. Um, and my life, you know, I'm in a really good place in my life that that's one thing I do not want to, um, I don't want to lose my life. I remember when I got sober, <clears throat> I got sober at 27 and I remember meeting guys that were getting sober at 40 and 50 and 60 and I'm like, if they were able to party like all this time, why do I have to get sober at 27? Now I see it as I got sober at 27 and I've been able to enjoy my adult life. I've been able to, like I mentioned, go, I went back to school. <clears throat> I am waiting to hear back about, um, I submitted an ap application for a doctor program in education. Um, it just seems so surreal for me because this kid from Glasso Park that was just trying to stay away from gangs and drugs is now going towards a doctorate in education. Mind you, um, I work currently with gang associated youth. I worked with eight for eight years with gangs in LA. So it's just kind of like a, a 360 turnaround of like using my own experience of growing up in these neighborhoods and then giving back now to the community and trying to help those younger kids make something out of their life because, you know, I might not have the lived experience of like an actual gang member, but I have the lived experience of living in poverty with re little resources, with family members and gangs and being able to come out of that and triumph. Um, it just it seems so surreal that this kid from Glasgow Park, Highland Park, Franklin, Dr. Rivera, like that's just, it's crazy to even think about it because um, I could have ended my life at 19, 18, um, 26, and none of this would have happened. Um, I wouldn't have met my babies. My first one, Kobe, he's the one that um, was barking and barking when I was, um, my bed, um, <clears throat> though my mom found me, to my current dog, Athena, who, <laughs> she's my big baby. I mean, I do anything for her. Um, when I think about my dogs, like that's what I have right now is my emotional support and my dog staff. I mean, not that dogs could understand what you say, but like she definitely senses when I'm not feeling good. Um, and I, I do not know what's going to happen to me the day that she dies. And I'm not, I shouldn't think about it, but 